what is a Masuda Kunai? A uh, Masuda Kunai is a business law firm. So when I look at myself as an employment lawyer, I'm giving business advice with an employment twist. And we represent, obviously, a lot of Japanese American companies in the Chicago area. Think of the Panchario, who's taking a metro train today. Right, all right, when you go into that vestibule, you'll see a little, little uh, thing called Nippon Chariot. They made the railroad cars. All the way from Nippon Chariot here in Chicago to German first tier suppliers to Caterpillar down in central <coughs> Illinois to American uh, owned companies from Walker Brothers Bakery at Walker Brothers Restaurant to, uh, to other American companies throughout the country. So it's a very interesting, diverse, diverse clientele. And what's fascinating to me is it doesn't matter who owns the company. It's the same issue. And because you're dealing with employees and you're dealing with crazy employees, especially when there is a full moon. And I had to start today, we're going to talk about social media, but I had to start today with a case that came out yesterday. Because you can't make this stuff up. You just, I mean, think about what's going on in your, in your companies. And I hope, you know, not that stuff is going on, but you just can't make this up. So this was at uh, TV, TV One. TV One is in Maryland. And there's a show in the morning, you know, like at 9 o'clock in the morning after uh, the Today Show called TV One on One. And the station's founder also employs his mother in the company. And the mother and the CEO of the station is unmarried, this unmarried man in his 40s. And his mother is there. And she, of course, wants to marry him off, right? Doesn't every mother want to marry off their son, especially a nice, rich son? And there's a young woman there at the company. And according to the employee, the CEO's mom subjected her to sex discrimination and harassment by repeatedly trying to get her to start a romance with the CEO. The mom said, I am going to be your mother one way or the other. If you don't marry my son, I'm going to marry your father and be your mother and be your stepmother. A little, a little while later, the CEO's mom sternly asked why the employee was not yet married. Why aren't you married, right? If you're over 40 and you're a CFO and the CEO comes to you and says, isn't it time you retire? That's a problem, right? All right, so she says, why aren't you married yet? And then she says, you know, I know why. You're so old, your eggs will only create retarded children. Hey. Wouldn't you like a mother like that pushing for you at your company? <laughs> so of course, what does the employee do? She sues, right? She wins in federal court. I mean, what a great case. So think about all the interesting people in your companies, right? And, but, and I'm here to talk about social media, but I'm also here to make you angry, all right? I, and it's very easy for CFOs to be angry at the government. And so I'm going to fulfill my job responsibility today to make you even angrier at the government, right? So how many of your employees are using uh, LinkedIn and Facebook? All of, your, all of them, of course. How many of them are using it on company time? How many are talking about you, Marty, on their Facebook account? What do you think they're saying about Marty on his Facebook account? Well, let's see what happens at the sports bar. At the sports bar is a non-union company. The owners under-withheld state income taxes for Jamie LaFrance, a former employee. Jamie posted the following on her Facebook page. Someone should do the owners of the company a favor and buy it from them. They can't even do the tax paperwork properly. I owe money WTF. Now, I'm not allowed to swear, you know, unlike Donald Trump. <laughs> WTF. Well, of course, Vincent Spinelli, one of the cooks, he clicks the like option. How many people click like options all the time, right? Jillian Sansoni <coughs> writes, I owe money to what on a hole? Triple play. Of course, you're going to terminate both. Vincent and Jillian. Now they, they even have policy, right? They follow their policy. 
employees will not engage in inappropriate discussions. We don't want employees engaging in inappropriate discussions, don't we? You know, and this is quite inappropriate. They go to this wonderful organization, the National Labor Relations Board. How many have heard of the NLRB? Hey, do you know that I was literally born at the NLRB? My mother worked at the NLRB when she became pregnant with me in 1951. So I'm an NLRB baby. <laughs> now, that doesn't mean I'm always in favor of everything at the NLRB. So when we go through this, don't think I am supporting everything that the NLRB does, although I was born at the NLRB. All right, so what is this National Labor Relations Act? How many of you are unionized at your companies? All right, as you know, employees have the right to engage in union activities, to organize a union. But they also have the right to engage in something called concerted activities for their mutual aid and protection. And a company may not interfere with those rights. And they can't treat people differently who engage in these concerted activities for their mutual aid and benefit. And look at this, the mere maintenance, look at that, mere maintenance of a rule can violate, can interfere with employees' rights. So how many of you have employee handbooks? Of course, all of you, right? Boy, you better have that employee handbook. You pay $10,000 for it, right? And it's sitting on the shelf, not even enforced, right? But those rules are there. Those rules are there. All right. So what are the implications when Jillian and Vincent sue under the board, when they, su when they sue, they can get their jobs back. They can get their back pay, less than term earnings. The company, oh, this is the, this, my father uh, always made fun of me being at the board because I would spend days preparing for trial, right? And I would spend, you know, six months in a trial going against, you know, Boeing or I don't mean to pick up Boeing. And actually, Boeing has had interest. Oh, Boeing, you're the. Boeing has had some very interesting issues with the labor board in South Carolina. And, absolutely. And uh, so, and so my father would say, "Oh, the worst thing is that you have to post a notice for 60 days, telling the employees, I'm so sorry, it'll never happen again." Right? So my father, I mean, isn't this nice for a father to say, you're nothing but a paper tiger, you're prosecuting these companies? I mean, so thank you, Dan. But unlike Title VII in federal court, sex discrimination, etc., no compensatory damages, none of those damages, and of course you have to pay your lawyer. All right, so let's go back. Right, and, oh, and if there was a union election, and you have these rules, and a rule is unlawful, and the company wins, the labor board will overturn the election and have a second election for the union. So let's go back. Triple play sports bar. So who can tell me what the concerted protection act, concerted protected activities are? Catherine, what are, so concerted activities is more than one. Which employees engaged in activities involving more than one employee. So are you doing the same at the work, right? Right. So, I mean, I guess the difference is that they were trying to define the policy and the reason they were wrong, they were okay. I mean, that was within the bounds of the law. Well, the bounds of the law, yes. Mm -hmm. But let's look at Vincent. Did he engage in concerted activity more than one employee by pressing that like button here? No. You'd say no, who would say yes? Marty would say yes. It's on Facebook, more than one. All right, Jillian, she wrote back on Facebook, I owe money to what an a-hole. Is that concerted activity? Is that more than one? You say no, who would say yes? You would say yes, all right? I mean, this is what makes great litigation, right? All right, so was the policy lawful? The policy said, you shall not make these types of disparaging comments or comments like that. Did that interfere with Jillian's right to press the like button? Probably yes, probably less. All right, 
Was the conduct, we talked about conduct, concerted? Did, um, did Jamie LaFrance, right, now he's a former employee, did he engage in concerted activity? Did he induce other people for action? Well, yes, he did, but he's not an employee. He does have, doesn't have any rights to sue. Now, when you pick that, press that like button, did you induce anyone to take action? Well, yeah, you induced Vincent to then say, I owe to what an a-hole. All right, concerted activity. Is the activity protected? So now, not only do you have to have concerted activity, you have to have it protected activity. Now, she called that manager an a-hole. I mean, Howard, are you going to allow your employees to call you an a-hole? Yeah, I mean, how can the government protect that language? Should the government, all right, you're in the government now, all right, you've been appointed by Obama, or you've been appointed by Trump, okay, you're at the board in Washington. Think about who Trump would point, appoint to the labor board. I think we should all go vote for him now, right? No, um, I mean, should you protect people who call other people a -hole? Is the post that was posted, was that disparaging of the company's products and services? What did, right, that's a good question, Catherine, isn't it? You know, they owe me money to what an a-hole? All right, and he pressed like. Did he disparage the company's products? Maybe not. Maybe, it's a, is it a personal issue here as opposed to a group issue? Well, obviously, I put this up because the government found a violation. All right, let's, let's go to Pittsburgh. How many are from Pittsburgh? No one here from Pittsburgh. You, you've all seen the pierogies at the Pittsburgh game on TV? Andrew Kurtz was a pierogi. What a great career. When the team owner, I shouldn't say that, that's terrible. When the team owner decided to keep the manager, he wrote this on Facebook. Coonley extended the contract of Russell. That means a 19 straight losing streak. Way to go, Pirates. And he was fired. All right. We've now learned we're all labor board experts now, right, in the room. We all know what concerted protected activity is. Did he get his job back or not? What do you think, Howard? No. You think no, why? Uh, he's, disparaging, uh, he's disparaging their product. He's disparaging their product. Who else has an opinion? He's stating an opinion. Does the opinion have anything to do with his wages, hours, and benefits? Absolutely correct. I mean, what does, he'll have a 19 straight losing streak, what does that have to do with his wages and benefits and working conditions? Excuse me? His bonus, that's right. Because the better the company, oh, you're a plaintiff lawyer, you're a, you, we have a union lawyer in our midst. All right, she came up with the arguments, right? Because if there's a 19 game losing streak, the company's going to make less money at the end of the year, there'll be a less bonus for the employee. So he's complaining about his protected, his, his protected activity, his wages, benefits, working conditions. He hasn't called anyone a bad name, right? But has he, but has he really talked about his wages, benefits, and working conditions? That became the issue at the government. And the government found that it was lawful to terminate him. Because, yeah, maybe he put it on Facebook, maybe that was concerted, maybe he got other people to like, but it wasn't protected because it wasn't about his wages, benefits, and working conditions, right? So if I go to, to you, Steve, and I say, Steve, I want to race, does Steve have the right to say, you want to race, there's the door? How many people say Steve could say that? All right, you're right, Vincent. Because I'm only complaining about myself. It's not concerted. If I go up to Steve and say, you know, Frank and I were talking, and the wages are not fair at this company. We want a release. 
that's conservative. That's protective. All right, let's talk about the waiters. At Pier 60, during work and three days before an election, so there's no union there yet, Herman Perez's supervisor loudly instructed him to turn your head that way and stop chit-chatting. Because obviously, Herman should be working. He should be chit-chatting. Herman went on break and on his Facebook page wrote, Bob is such a nasty MF. Don't know how to talk to people. F his mother. What a loser. I mean, not, not only Trump isn't the only one who uses the word loser. Uh, vote yes for the union. The post was visible to co-workers and he was fired. Evidence showed, what did it show? The workplace was filled with profanity by whom? By supervisors and employees. All right, was the termination lawful? All right, you say yes, was the termination unlawful? You say no, all right, go ahead. What's your analysis? Um, the language that he used was acceptable in his workplace. Uh -huh. so there wasn't an issue there, and it was prior to the a union election, uh -huh. and he was voted or expressing his position on the election. Oh, okay. So he was being protected. So you think it'd be uh, the gentleman behind you? I forgot your name. Uh, Vince. But, okay. Why did you say that it's uh, lawful to fire him? Well, I think he's um, I forget the term that you use, but he's uh, inciting other employees against. Uh, oh, he's inciting other employees yeah. to take action. Yeah. Right. Okay. Anyone disagree with the analysis so far? I mean, it's an interesting case. All right, so was the speech, where was the place of discussion? It was on Facebook, right? Is that a public place? Well, it is a public place. What was the nature of the statement? It had a lot of F-bombs, but there was evidence that everyone uses F-bombs. Did the company provoke the statement? That's interesting. Did the company provoke the statement? The supervisor said, no, why, why wasn't that a pro pro provocation? Absolutely. How can that be a provocation? Absolutely. Our union steward has now turned management. <laughs> Congratulations, you've seen the light. <laughs> uh, is there anti-union animus here? Stop the chit-chatting? I don't think so. Did the employee act impulsively? or deliberately, would, would, would you use that as a, it probably was impulsive, right? I mean, is that a factor that the government should look at? I don't think so, but yet the government wanted to look at that. Did the company consider the language offensive? No. Was there a rule preventing a language? How many of you have rules preventing the use of profanity? And think about it. You, you may have social media policies, internet policies, email use policies. There's nothing unlawful about a policy that says do not use profanity. How does that interfere with people's right to organize unions? It doesn't. Was the discipline typical of discipline given to other employees? Should that be a factor? I, probably yes. Probably yes. I, in that case, uh, he did get his job back. Yeah. Yes. If you go back to the first case, yes. and this, how much does it, what difference does it make what administration's National Labor Relations Board is making decisions? Yeah, tremendous difference. Tremendous difference. You know, we are, we're all talking this week about uh, Justice Scalia and his dissents. What's fascinating at the Labor Board is every four years, there's a new president or every eight years. And the terms of the labor board members, there's five labor board members um, nominated by the president, advice and consent of the Senate, and the tradition at the labor board, and, and I worked at the labor board in Washington as well as here in Chicago, the tradition is you're going to have two Democrats, two Republicans, and one neutral. That's the tradition. And that's the tradition from 1936 on. Until it got to, when you pick, who you're going to blame, uh, people either blame Carter or Reagan for politicizing the labor board. 
the same argument we're having now as to who's politicizing the Supreme Court, right? Is it the Democrats or the Republicans? Someone's politicizing something. So yes, it absolutely makes a difference because what's happening is that <coughs> presidents pick people who are going to be in their favor. Well, it has precedent for the NLRB. And Forever? Well, it's persuasive. It's not precedential. Okay, so a new board member, no, new board members come in. They're appointed by uh, Ted Cruz. Okay, and now those labor board members are going to look at previous board decisions. Are are we persuaded by their arguments? And then they'll come up and say, no, we're not persuaded anymore. We're going to change the law. And think about it. You're a CFO. You have to run your company. And suddenly, four years from now, all the rules change. And then four years later, the rules change back. And I mean, it's really not good. And uh, so since the 1980s, the late 70s, 80s, there's been this back and forth. And it really takes a lot to keep, invo keep involved. The, the scary part, which I think I needed that course on, was that these laws apply to all of your companies, even if you don't have a union. And that's what's scary, and that's what most companies don't realize. What's happening is that plaintiff lawyers out there, union lawyers, are getting very smart. Think of yourself as a plaintiff lawyer. You want to make money. You're a lawyer to make money. So you're going to find employees to bring lawsuits. Here's another statute that's now been expanded even more than the statute to protect employees in non-union companies. All right, so do you need a social media policy? This is a strategic decision. And all of you employ human resource professionals. How many of your human resource professionals are strategic? And how many are tactical? And do you think of your human resource professionals as tactical or strategic? You want to try that question on? I'm sure. Well, okay. I think that they should be strategic. Say that again? They should be strategic. They should be strategic. The company, That's right. And are you hiring the right? Okay. You disagree? No, I think you have to vote. You have to vote, yes. Yeah, you, you hope that if you have, now many of you are large enough to have a whole group of HR professionals, um, which means maybe the VP of HR or the director of HR is a more strategic person, the HR manager is more tactical. But if you're small enough or mid-sized you have an HR manager, that manager is probably overburdened with the tactical stuff and doesn't have time for the strategic. Or you're not even and I'll, I'll use this word on behalf of HR professionals, you're not allowing them to be part of the C-suite. How many of, uh, all right, Catherine, did I hit a button there? Yeah. Like, you've got finance representatives, you've got sales, you've got marketing, you've got a HR person. That's right, don't, yeah, now I, I hope that, you know, what I want to do is speak on behalf of HR people. There are HR professionals who should be part of the C-suite and who should be brought into meetings when there are strategic issues to decide. And one of those strategic issues is, do you need a social media policy? And I asked all, all of you at the very beginning, how many of you have employees using social media? And how many of them are using it on your company time? And what are they doing on company time? And how many are using social media away from the company and talking about your company and talking about you? away from the company. And then how are you being looked at by other people in the community on all the people LinkedIn or on or Facebook friends of your employees? How does that impact your recruitment, your training? Oh my God, we're suddenly talking money. We're suddenly talking the risk management that CFOs are involved in. HR can help with the answer. So do you need a social media policy? All right, are you, so this is the question, and I don't know the answer. The question is for you. Are you better off making clear what is, accept, what is acceptable? 
Or are you encouraging people? If you encourage employees to tweet, do you need guidelines? Should you encourage it at all? And what should you do be doing about protecting your intellectual property? Do you want, I remember a, a field service technician of one of our American companies, uh, they make CNC machines, Elk Road Village, and uh, the field service engineer is setting up his own business in competition with his employer on his Facebook page, on his LinkedIn, he's offering information, intellectual property information. This is very interesting. Certainly not conservative protected, but it's using the social media to his own benefit, contrary to the company's economic well-being. So, what are, so let's go through some of these rules, and these rules are in uh, contest at the moment. All right, should we remind employees that all other company rules still apply? That's an easy one, okay? Yes, obviously. Should we encourage employees to report any inappropriate conduct, especially if they are victims? Probably yes. All right, we're getting a little, uh, you know, what type of inappropriate conduct? Um, restrict, can you restrict and prohibit off our comments about wages, benefits, and working conditions? Ron says no. Who says yes? All right. Probably no. That's right, Ron. Uh, can you include a no expectation of privacy notice for at work use? Absolutely. This is, I mean, one thing good that the Obama administration did, they found that your electronic communication equipment belongs to the company. What a simple idea. I mean, who paid for this equipment? Right? It's the company's equipment. Now, employees have certain rights. And, uh, but yeah, there's no expectation of privacy. The company reserves the right to access and monitor employees' use of electronic equipment. Is that a lawful policy? Absolutely. Oh, go ahead. If, um, if, if there's no expectation of privacy on the company's premises, if someone's using their own device, ah. Right. Probably the answer is no, but we're going to get but we're going to get a slide on that issue, and so but I'll give you the answer. The answer is if it's their own machine and they do not have their company's email on their machine, unlike me, all right, I have my law firm's email here. Right? I don't have an expectation of privacy. The IT person can go into my here and see my emails. I don't know if you can see anything else, but I can see my email use, right? And uh, all right. employees may not use the company's logo. How many of you allow or even think about the use of the company logo on employees' LinkedIn websites? Excuse me? I want them to use it. You want them to use it because marketing branding, all right, so now you have an employee, so now I'm going to twist it, right, good lawyer twist things, right? You've now fired Garrett. He was a terrible employee, right? And on his LinkedIn page is your logo because he used to work for you. Is that an endorsement of your company? Is that an endorsement of Garrett that he mentioned your company on his LinkedIn site? Wow. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, these are interesting issues. And, uh, and I had this issue with my, my son, just graduated college, he's putting together his resume. And resumes are electronic, all right? And so how many of you have your resume, electronic resume, how many of you have put logos of each company you worked for on your resume? Should you put a logo of a company on your resume? Yeah, I mean, you're making a face. Probably, no. Why would you? Yeah. Why would you? Well, that's the brand. What? Normally, companies' logos are copyrighted. Yeah, that's right. And does it, so does that mean that I, as a former employee, have the right to put the logo on my resume to 
sell myself because there is that logo of Pepsi or whatever. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, if you put your uh, profile in the LinkedIn yeah. and you type in such a they pop logos in there automatically. Yeah. Right? yeah. Have they obtained permission to do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably not. Probably not. One more golden opportunity. Yeah, another golden <laughs> opportunity for lawyers to bring up class action lawsuits. <laughs> But the logo is your property. You cannot prevent employees from mentioning the name of where they want. Uh, a, a policy, you cannot fail to contact the company before making a statement to the media. How many of you have policies saying you don't want your employees talking to the media without permission first? That's unlawful policy. Employees have a right to talk to the media. You must uh, provide the company access to posted comments on social media. That's unlawful. Companies don't have access to all of that. Uh, you cannot fail to write and post in a respectful manner. That's an interesting policy. So how many have policies? You have to speak respectfully to supervisors. It's kind of judgmental. Boy, isn't it? All right, now think about it. How are you going to define for yourself what's respectful? It's whatever I say it is. Whatever you say it is. That's right. It's not different than inappropriate, right? So now you're taking another human steward here, by the way, sitting in our midst. You're now taking the position of the Obama Labor Board. Okay. <laughs> All right. Managers and supervisors should think carefully before liking or friending. Can you have a policy like that? This is a trick question. The answer is yes. Why? Because managers and supervisors aren't protected by the federal government. Only employees are. You could fire a supervisor for helping employees organize a union. You could fire supervisors who come to you and demand wages, demand increases in wages as a group. They're not protected. They have no protection at all. So your comment that yeah. the National Labor Relations Board applied to employees of unions and non-unions, but only non-supervisors. That's right. Only non-supervisors. So the, 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 the non-exempt. That's right. That's right. Non-exempt. Which is much different than in other foreign countries. I mean, this is fascinating for our practice. We represent some Japanese subsidiaries. So the president of the Japanese subsidiary here in Chicago was a union member of the Japanese parent corporation in Japan. It's amazing. Now, of course, the history of unionization is different in Japan and Germany and Italy than it is in the United States. And so it's really interesting. So we have to look at our policies, again, from a strategic point of view, what's really needed to control our employees, to control the workplace, to create a culture, an environment where people are productive, but without violating the law. How do we implement our social media policy? Like we do everything else. We really have to think through it. We have to train. We have to distribute. We have to document the training. We have to really keep on the employees and the supervisors to make sure things are implemented. How many of you do yearly anti-harassment training? Hey, good for you, Catherine. Okay. <laughs> All right, but that's only two of you here. How many have a, I mean, here's another strategic issue. When you have new employee orientation, and this is another strategic issue for HR, is there a new employee, new employee orientation checklist? And that checklist includes that they were trained on harassment policies. It should, because the law says that if you have a policy and employees know about it, they were harassed and didn't complain about it, you have a defense. You win. So you could save $500,000. Think about that. Today, each of you are going to go back to your companies and save them $500,000 in the potential lawsuits by just saying, have an anti-harassment policy, train employees on it, and have them check off on it, 
in their new employee orientation. 500,000, where did they get 500,000? All right, you fire a mid-level engineer, they're making $60,000 a year, it takes two years to go to trial, that's 120,000. Pain and suffering, $90,000 sometimes is paid for pain and suffering by juries in Cook County. Uh, compensatory damages to find a new job, $25,000. Punitive damages, how many of you have more than 300 employees? Punitive damages in federal law is capped at $300,000. Attorney's fees, well, this is really great, <coughs> attorney's fees. Do you know that the plaintiff attorneys get to, if they win a case, they get to charge what's called the load star rate. The lodestar rate is the rate that the biggest lawyers in Chicago at the biggest firms charge their corporate clients. All right, whatever, six, seven hundred dollars an hour, right? A lot more than me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so then suddenly the plaintiff lawyer wins the case, they can get another $150,000 worth of attorney's fees. Now, it's interesting on sexual harassment cases, I'm off. Topic, obviously, and it's fascinating. What is really sexual harassment? So the jury then decides. The jury awards Catherine. Sorry to pick on you, Catherine. All right, I'll pick on, on Marty. Marty's been sexually harassed, okay? By, by Catherine, okay? <laughs> He's turning red. <laughs> all, right. And, all right, so the jury awards you $1, but your lawyer gets $150,000. Oh my, isn't that interesting how that works? So the training, the policies, these are really strategic issues. Uh, other social media hazards? So let, let's talk about them. Uh, recruitment, anti-harassment. We have to think of how social media is used with all these kinds of ideas. Let's look at LinkedIn and solicitations. I said that your company equipment belongs to the company. But under the labor board rules, and this is all the way back in the Eisenhower era, so we're talking about Republican members of the labor board, there's a difference between working time and non-working time. All right, what is your non-working time? Want to try that one, Ron? Non-working time. Well, how about when you're taking lunch? How about when you're on break? How about before and after you're working? Right? You may be at that computer, that company-owned equipment, but that's not in working time. So employees have a right to solicit for the Girl Scouts or whatever during um, or for a union during that non-working time. Do they have the right to go on social media during that non-working time? Yes, they do, unless, here's where you also save your company money, talk to your IT people. Vincent, okay, You're, you supervise IT. Does your company block all of your employees' access to social media? Do you want to do that? Do you want to block them to access to their personal Gmail accounts? That's interesting. Because if an employee is using their Gmail account, that Gmail account can bring a virus into your company equipment. Our law firm blocks all Gmail activity by our staff. We don't want the viruses. Viruses, especially if you're a law firm, you are really going to have serious uh, walls to protect you. My right, expectation of privacy we go down to your question. So we have Sergeant Jeff Kwan of the Ontario California Police Department received a department issued cell phone. A department issued cell phone, not his own. The police department gave notice of its right to monitor usage. The police department allowed Jeff to reimburse the police department when he exceeded his monthly allotment of messages. And they investigated, disciplined him for exceeding his allotment and sending sexually explicit text messages to his mistress. I love that. All right. So did the police department have a basis for the search? Absolutely, right? Because it's a department-issued cell phone. 
did they conduct a reasonable search? Okay, a reasonable search. They found the sexually explicit emails to his mistress. What do you think? You are now Judge Justice Scalia. This was one of his cases. Well, if they have a basis for the search, right? And if you discover something during the search, wouldn't that be a reasonable search? It's the what is called the fruit of a poisonous tree, right? How many heard that comment? If you, yeah, if you're if you're going into the trunk of the car, you have reasonable suspicion to stop someone and go into the trunk. Go into the trunk, you find heroin. It's the fruit of a poisonous tree. So absolutely, it was a reasonable search. Did Jeff have a reasonable expectation of this search? You say no. Excuse me. That's right. That's right. That's right. And there, then there was a policy. Uh, the PD gave notice of its right to monitor every internet policy. Again, you could save your company money. Go back tomorrow. Do they have a policy? There is no expectation of privacy for your use of company electronic communications equipment. Political speech, right? Question. Boy, how many people are talking politics in their office? Do you have a question, sir? Yeah. There's, there's, there's a situation in California that came up where they can't, don't have a password. If you have the right to search an employee's phone, or say a company's phone, which this was, do they have to give you the password? Or could, if it's asked for, do you have to turn it in? Um, <coughs> it depends upon each state law for that. Um, the question is whether or not you can require employees to give you the password. Uh, in Illinois, you cannot do that. Other other states, you can. Yeah, even though it's owned by, it's a phone that's owned by the company. Well, now, if, yeah, if it's a if it's a company password, yes, you could require the employees to give you the company password. But the personal password to the personal Gmail account that depends upon the state. So political speech, non-governmental. So now this is non-governmental employers, all of you. You may terminate employees for expressing political views. Now think about it. What's protected by federal law? Age, your race, right? Your national origin, your religion, not your political affiliation. That's not protected by federal law. Is it protected by state law? You bet in California it is. Of course. <laughs> Who said of course? We all said of course. <laughs> California, you can't fire someone for their political views. Now, this is non-governmental companies, right? Recreational activities. Marilyn Tagosen, I forgot how to pronounce her name. She has a historical fiction blog that she writes under a pseudonym. The company's code of conduct restricts employees from posting online personal speeches even during their free time. The company refused to hire her, lawful or unlawful. Who wants to try it? You want to try that one, Christy? Probably unlawful, you think, to hire her? Again, the question is going to be, the answer is going to be depending upon the state law. What? But not hire. Right, refuse to hire because they found out that she had the blog, and they don't want people doing that. Well, it depends upon the state. All right, let's see what the answer is. In Illinois, it would be unlawful, because Illinois has a right to privacy law. It protects employees who use lawful products during non-working hours. Well, a lawful product could be a blog. So if you smoke, in Illinois, can you refuse to hire someone who smokes? No, you can't refuse to hire them. Smoking is lawful. Can you refuse to hire someone who uses a motorcycle? No, a motorcycle is lawful. <coughs> Those are lawful activities. Under New York state law, there's a recreational activities occurring outside working hours off the company's president without the use of company's equipment cannot be used. That's a basic decision. So New York and Illinois, they protect employees' rights to engage in lawful activities. 
amazing. But in a way, I mean, we all want to engage in lawful activities, and we don't want to be hurt by them. So you have to turn to all of the pro-employee people. <laughs> Personal password protection. All right, this is now to answer your question. Illinois, again, has a right to privacy in the workplace law. Unlawful to request or require current and prospective employees to provide a password to their own uh, email personal system. It's unlawful to demand access to a website. This is Illinois. This type of law is going around the country. So we have to be careful what law we're in. So what's your action plan? Your action plan is figure out, go back tomorrow, talk to HR. What are your needs? What are your challenges? What, and what do you want to accomplish? Maybe you do want your employees talking about your products on Facebook and saying how great they are. That's great. Uh, we represent a, uh, a toothbrush manufacturer. And we want our employees using the toothbrushes and talking about the toothbrushes on their Facebook page. It's great marketing, right, next to their logo. What are your policies, regulations? What policies do you want, and how do you implement them? Go ahead. Are they allowed to say that they don't like a toothbrush? Well, yeah, they are. They are, obviously. Yeah, but we hope they don't. <laughs> we hope they don't. Yes? It, it's unlawful to require passwords to be shared. Is it lawful to request passwords if it's clearly indicated that it's not? Oh, see, we have a lawyer in the back. <laughs> Right, right. So if you're a first, if you're the first year associate at oh, T and M or whatever, uh, Ernst and Young, E and J, and the supervisor requests you for the password, I think there's a difference in the power structure there, isn't there? So yeah, probably unlawful. Probably unlawful. So, uh, so what questions do you guys have? Yes, go ahead. Can I pose a scenario to you? Um, if one of your uh, employees posts somewhere that the company's practices are unlawful or some some other um, communication that might have a safe harbor from a whistleblower perspective, mm -hmm. um, is that a, a reasonable way to look at that? Is yeah, that's another thing. Like that, in that fashion? Yes, uh, Catherine, did you, you had the answer? Oh, no, sorry. Oh, okay. Okay, no, it is, yeah, because employees have whistleblower protection. So, and one of the biggest Illinois cases on whistleblower was with a CFO who disagreed with the CEO on how to uh, account for certain revenue brought into the company, right, on the accounts, uh, on the accounts. And so that CFO was fired. However, he refused to violate IRS regulations. Uh, that's it's a whistleblower type action. Uh, and you could make a scenario where employees are using Facebook doing whistleblower. Right? And therefore, it would be unlawful. The key issue here, and this is where, again, HR and you are all value added to your companies, is doing a risk analysis every time you're doing a termination of an employee. So think about who makes decisions in your company on terminations. Is it that supervisor? Or is it the CFO? Is it the general counsel? Does every termination go through the president? And I'll give you the best example. I think Jim was at one of my presentations where I talked about Rosebud restaurants. And Rosebud restaurants had an employee a female employee who was the hostess at one of the restaurants became pregnant, and the manager of that restaurant said, we don't want pregnant women as a host in our restaurant. She was assigned to the back, you know, by the, you know, getting all the plates ready for uh, presentation to the customers. And then she went off on FMLA leave, and then they said, oh, well, you quit, we're not bringing you back. $500,000 liability there. I, it, this was great. I don't think Jim was at this presentation, but I gave a presentation to, um, <clears throat> to a group of CFOs in transition, 
in Schaumburg. And sitting in the audience was a CFO for Rosebud Restaurants. <laughs> how embarrassing, okay? Here I'm just telling how awful Rosebud Restaurants is. But, but I, got the, I got the scoop. The scoop is very interesting. He was the CFO after the court found the violation. So I said, Bill, what's the story? He said, the story is we didn't have HR. What do you mean? You're Rosebud Restaurants. You have 12 restaurants. Oh, you didn't have HR? No. Each restaurant manager was his own HR manager. All right, now think about it. You've been to a Rosebud restaurant. You've been to a whatever restaurant you can think of. Do you really want to have that restaurant manager in charge of HR? Don't you want to have some system within the company so that manager reports to the district manager or to HR? Walker Brothers, all right, has how many restaurants? Five, six, seven restaurants? They have an HR manager. Everything goes through Pete. Now his office is in the Arlington Heights restaurant in the back there, there's, there's a whole office complex. He helps decisions with Mr. Walker, uh, terminations and all those kinds of things. That's how you properly organize your company. You, and you know that as compliance officers, CFO compliance officers, it's right, two people who sign a check. You have all these corporate compliance rules. You need the same with HR. And so what we've presented to you today is these PowerPoint slides, take them to your companies, give them to your HR professionals. We've also presented a newsletter. We come out with our newsletter every month. Uh, they are free. And so if you're interested, you can go to our website and sign up for these free webinars, uh, free newsletters. We also have free webinars and seminars during the year. Bob has been to our annual seminar. And we have a really exciting uh, seminar coming up next month uh, with BPI. Who knows BPI? Uh, you, know, you know BPI. BPI is a, a major consulting company here in Chicago. And we're going to be talking about transitioning employees. And uh, so if you're interested in that program, you can contact me on email. It's going to be very interesting because, again, we're talking strategic. What's the difference between terminating and transitioning an individual employee and transitioning a group of employees. There's real differences. There's real strategic differences, not only to the law, but to the brand of the company and how it's going to look on glass door. And so there needs to be planning for all of these issues. There needs to be thought through the implications of every decision you make. And so I, I'm going to leave you then with a funny story of a company on implications. And this was a company that was an industrial, um, they made bags, industrial bags. And they had uh, about 95 employees sitting in industrial sewing machines um, sewing up the bags. And they had the president, so that was the factory floor. And then they had the front part of the factory. Everyone knows how factories are made, right? You have the front part of the factory, which is two levels. And on the second level, the president of the company would stand in front of the one-way mirror. And like Captain Quig, he would march back and forth, looking at all the employees on their industrial sewing machines. And something struck him about all these women on these industrial sewing machines. They were leaving their machines all times of the day. And they were going to the washer. Can you imagine such a terrible thing? But if you're the president of Captain Creek and you are pacing back and forth in front of the window, you don't like this because it's affecting productivity. So what do you do? You issue a rule, right? To all your women, all your employees, including the women employees. What's the rule, Catherine? You can never go to the washroom except on break and lunchtime. All right. How many days did it take for the employees to ask a union to represent them? One day. <laughs> it does about three. <laughs> because, of course, the factory is near the local bar. 
and they go to local bar, and who's at the local bar but unionized employees from the factory next door, right? They're complaining, here's a card, boom. Every decision you make as a manager has implication. You gotta think of that before you make your decision. So I thank you very much, and it's been great to talk to you.